good evening everyone uh, it's nice to uh, see you all and i'm so happy that uh, you have so willingly um, joined to learn or share our knowledge and experiences about the topic so i'm going to share my screen where some of those might be a bit theoretical but i would try i would mostly try to work or talk around them I hope you all can see my slide. Right. So today we would uh, be talking about uh, working with children who have experienced trauma and abuse. <clears throat> So I would like to start with a quote, right, by Nathaniel Brandon. So he said that the greater a child's terror and the earlier it is experienced, the harder it becomes to develop a stronger and healthy sense of self, right? So this quote is actually something that's very insightful, especially for us who work as mental health professionals. Uh, so <laughs> what we can get to know from this is that obviously the more the child suffers or goes through and if it is experienced at a very early age it becomes very difficult for this particular child to develop a strong and healthy sense of self right so this is something that we as counselors also encounter when uh, we see clients <clears throat> or get to know cases especially with the rise in the number of abuses, uh, number of child abuse cases in Sri Lanka. Moving on, I would like to start with a bit of statistics, recent statistics, which I'm sure most of you know, because it has been all over the news. Uh, so some of the recent, so there are about five, but some of the most recent uh, uh, incidents regarding child abuse and trauma uh, that's been all over the news is Number one, the trafficking of a 15-year-old child for commercial sex work. So that is something that has been <clears throat> around the news, all over the news, and with a lot of details, and is involved uh, a lot of people, a lot of adults, even at responsible positions. And uh, the uh, one of the other interesting, like uh, alarming, I would say, cases, cases about how there have been over 17,000 child pornography videos that has been uploaded on the internet just between a month, right? And around 4,000 complaints over child abuse cases. So the NCPA has also stated that there has been about 48,000 calls on child harassment that it has received. So um, it shows how very prevalent this issue is in Sri Lanka right now and even in 2020 how there have been a total of 2055 child abuse cases with no convictions so it's scary how child abusers can commit all the crime but the children are to suffer so what we need to understand about child abuse and trauma is that it is more than what we think more than the definitions, more than the theoretical aspects, more than what just we see and think in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So more than two-thirds of children reported at least one traumatic event by age 16. So that is a lot. More than two-thirds of children is quite a lot of children. So that and the fact that it's age 16 makes it quite scary as well. So when you say child abuse and trauma doesn't necessarily only mean physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect or just that, right? There's so much more. So like you can see on the screen, uh, obviously psychological, physical, and sexual abuse, community of school violence, experiencing or witnessing violence happening uh, around these community, around the community they live, or even in school, especially in countries like you know the uh, United States, where they have open gun shootings and things like so that. Even in Sri Lanka, when you see the war was won, and now even ethno-racial uh, violence is also uh, could be one of the ways that children could be traumatized. 
So then witnessing or experiencing domestic violence, something that is also on the rise because uh, especially with COVID, people are constrained to their homes and there has been an increase, a surge in the numbers of domestic violence and abuse. So witnessing that, not necessarily even experiencing, but even witnessing that, or even worse, experiencing domestic violence is another aspect of trauma that children face. National disasters, terrorism. So we are right now in something, the pandemic is something similar to a disaster. So that itself can be traumatizing for children of these uh, children of different ages, including us as adults. Then commercial sexual exploitation, a very famous thing that we are um, seeing, reading, these days, uh, the sudden or violent loss of a loved one, refugee or war experiences, military family related stressors. So how the loss of a parent, how the parent is injured, the loss of a leg, a part of a body. So that then physical or sexual assault. So it doesn't mean abuse, but even an assault, even if it's once somewhere in the bus or on the way home, walking from school, even if it's just one place that could be equally traumatizing neglect so neglect is when the children children are not provided the attention that they require from their primary caregivers so that also is traumatizing and then serious accidents or life-threatening illnesses so these are among some of the things that uh, are potentially traumatic events for children so one of the main things important things is to recognize signs of trauma I think and because parents are able to recognize some changes or teachers are able to do that, only they refer them for more uh, for more treatment or more support, right? So most of the time, like unlike an adult who can walk themselves inside for therapy or counseling, children are not that way. So children present certain symptoms or present certain signs that makes parents feel um, why they're doing, why they're bringing, make them feel like they need to bring their child in for support, right? So even as counselors, I think it is important for us to recognize signs of trauma because it could be different in different children, right? So young children may have, uh, react in one particular way while older children, older children could react in a different manner, right? So... It is also important that we recognize, know how to recognize signs of trauma. It's not just to bring in the child for treatment, but sometimes there could be children who come in for counseling for different reasons, right? So the parent brings saying, Baba Hari Dangai, or Iskoli Arakarana, Kina Deahana. They come in for different reasons, right? They could come in for some random reason, and then while you are working with the child, you might be able to recognize certain signs. Then as a counselor, as a professional, it is our responsibility to probe a bit more and to figure out what exactly this child is experiencing. So like I said, different age groups experience trauma in different manners, right? So, sorry, I haven't played the screen. So preschool children, you uh, could witness them, their trauma, when they especially uh, fear being separated from the parent or caregiver, like an excessive fear, right? Uh, sometimes we call this separation anxiety, but separation anxiety itself is an anxiety disorder. But, you know, when you can rule out that there is something else that's bothering this child, then, you know, there is something that has been traumatizing or affecting this child. Cry or scream a lot. So children in this age are not very good at verbalizing or saying out things through words. So they would resort to crying or screaming or throwing tantrums or showing a lot of anger, right? Throwing things, right? So this could be their way of expressing that something is not right. So there are instances where parents blame the children. This child is getting angry a lot. I don't know what to do with him or her. So the parent in turn ends up hitting the child again, right? Instead of, you know, sitting and trying to understand the problem, sometimes it's difficult for the parents to do that, right? Then eating poorly or losing weight. Parents think it's 
sometimes when preschool children don't do eat so again they are force fed or uh, you know they are just scolded for it right or uh, they are brought in to the doctors messi rakta ekak clear denna badin inna hadenna or something like that right and then they have nightmares nightmares is something that's very frequent in this this age group right even low i would say so uh, nightmares are the way how they express their fear so when parents tell you that these are prevalent like they are experienced a lot then i think it's important that we probe in a bit more to understand what kind of issue that they may be going through right then elementary school children so elementary school children are children from starting from grade 1 to about grade 5 so then they are very anxious and fearful they don't even talk they are very scared of talking right and uh, generally they are being bubbly but you know they can get anxious when they see new people but they are generally they are excessively anxious or fearful when they have to go through abuse or trauma the feeling of guilt or shame so this is something that children who have gone through trauma and abuse feel a lot a feeling so they feel that they allowed it to happen they played a part in whatever that took place right so it's it's very sad about how these children put out uh, feel this guilt or shame for the whole trauma taking place so there was this instance where there was this child he was i think a 9 year old and um, his father passed away so through a uh, sudden illness right and uh, the fact that it at such a young age having 9 year old yeah so the fact of having to experience a loss of the father processing that right was itself it is itself something very hard to go through i'm sure you all understand that but suddenly he was starting to experience a lot of guilt right and kept telling the mother like even sitting in night i am a bad person i am a bad person amma i am a bad person right so and then the mother had to probe in a bit and then the child came out to say that he was abused sexually by two cousin brothers older cousin brothers right so it was then and he felt like he was a bad person because he also participated in that act and he allowed it to happen and did not tell anyone about it right and this was haunting this child like after they went to the father's burial and everything and they came back home and in the night and the days following after he used to wake up in the middle of the night like with a nightmare and kept on saying about how he was uh, guilty about being a bad person and his father would be ashamed of him because he is now not there anymore right so this is a real story right and uh, they had to the parents had the mother and the family had to thereafter uh, help that particular child with their issue right and bringing him in for counseling right so that is how these children can feel guilt or shame right so have a hard time concentrating so they can't concentrate in school the teachers start complaining this child is not concentrating in class not doing the homework not doing the class work so what happens is we only have the tendency the teachers the parents have the tendency to only look at it at that way why is the child not concentrating ah we must give more support extra support extra homework uh, remedial teaching that is what is usually uh, considered as options but instead it could be something else something that has traumatized the child and have difficulty sleeping they do not fall asleep they are scared if something will happen usually from as far as how i work with children they have a fear about how they something bad will happen when they go to sleep staying awake and keeping that eyes open kept they made them feel safe right so this is how a few ways of how elementary school children express signs of trauma and abuse middle and high school children a very difficult age group to work with right they feel depressed or alone because they are battling it on their own and they can make sense of things to a certain extent right unlike elementary school children preschool children they can't make sense of the trauma abuse most of the time 
but middle and high school children have some kind of ability to make sense of it so and they don't have the guts or are not able to share it with anyone making them feel depressed and alone right so then they go on to develop eating disorders or self harming behaviors because um, they have the tendency to feel they don't have control over how they are feeling right so because it's a lot lonely because they can't share things with anyone about their abuse or trauma they don't know how to share what to say whom to say they are struggling the battle on their own right and then they develop eating disorder self harm behaviors because that makes them feel like they are in control of themselves or they can't control the pain or they can't control what's happening them so they feel like if they can inflict pain they have that control over allowing themselves to be, feel the pain that make them feel more alive because sometimes with repeated exposure to abuse or trauma these children get feel the feeling of numbness right and then the beginning of abusing alcohol or drugs because it makes them forget it or makes them feel like this might be the way out right and become involved in risky sexual behavior something that is also quite prevalent although we don't talk about it so risky sexual behavior with you know uh, without any protection putting them in a lot of physical and emotional risk so that's like their uh, temporary coping strategy right so that is also these are some of the things that uh, middle and high school children experience so if we go on to talk about the impact of childhood trauma so what we need to know most importantly that although it happens in childhood doesn't mean that it will resolve in childhood it is going to last well beyond childhood for years and years even during adulthood right so research has shown that child trauma survivors so those children who have survived trauma may experience learning problems in their lives so more suspensions more expulsions lower grades increased use of health and mental health services so children turn up with a lot of stomach aches lot of headaches leg pains lot of physical you know somatic symptoms that they show they because they don't express they don't talk no? so it comes out physically so lot of somatic symptoms are present in these children and then they uh, complain of frequent aches and pains in the body and the parents have to pre keep bringing them in for uh, into the hospital so again although they might their mental health uh, condition might not be diagnosed at first right but there might be an increased use of health services as well so increased involvement with the child welfare and juvenile justice system so they commit crimes uh, have a tendency to you know use drugs and get caught to doing certain crimes and end up with the juvenile uh, prisons then long term health problems like diabetes and heart disease right so trauma is a risk factor for nearly all behavioral health and substance use disorders so it's like a basic risk factor for every single thing that we can name as a disorder trauma in childhood that's how huge its impact is but there is hope so children can recover from traumatic events and they do they do even now with the right support so you can play an important role in their recovery right because otherwise they might have a very bleak future without very unstable future without your appropriate support so a critical part of a child's recovery is to have a supportive caregiving system so trauma informed caregiving systems like people who are informed in how to treat children with trauma right so that would help them so the other thing about understanding trauma more is about how trauma can affect all areas of life right so like i said they might have a lot of learning difficulties and things like that right so low grades more suspensions and expulsions so what happens to these children are that they are belittled even more even at school so parents and you know teachers put them down even more make them feel like they are useless and constantly keep nagging and saying that they are not good in anything right so this can result in complex trauma right and complex trauma can lead to children displaying behaviors or attitudes 
that meet diagnostic criteria for several different psychiatric disorders. So that makes it scarier, right? So children might present different behaviors, right? And that's because they have a complexity in their trauma. So when you take them to a doctor or a psychiatrist, and when sometimes this trauma is not assessed, they are instead given a di diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder. So when they are diagnosed like that, they might be given certain drugs or behavioral interventions. Then, so that might not be what the child needs. So inappropriate drug use. That could also have uh, a negative impact on the child. So what you also need to remember is that sometimes children who have experienced repetitive uh, instance of trauma only uh, have emotional difficulties. But there are also children who have experienced only one single thing, but also face a lot of emotional difficulties. So however, long-term damage. So long-term damage is most likely if this trauma is a repeated event and includes betrayal by a significant adult. So if it is someone whom they trusted and close and this was done by them, then the damage is quite significant, right? So there are cases where multiple cases that I have been handling where the there have been girls who have come uh, later in life in their 20s realizing that they were sexually abused by their own brothers when they were both young, like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So, and they had trusted their brother to keep repeating this with them at home. And when they grew older and knew what it meant, it tore them apart because they were still living with them on the same roof. Not like you have an abuser who you don't see again in your life, right? You live with this person right under your roof, right? And every time you see them, it reminds you of everything and makes you feel guilty. And like all clients who come with trauma, they have this guilt. I allowed this to happen. I let this happen. Why didn't I shout? Why didn't I tell my mother? Why didn't I trust? I could have understood. I should have realized. So that guilt is always there, right? So again, if it is betrayed by a significant person, then that damage is quite long term. So where caregivers are traumatized by an event. So when you now normally when the child is traumatized, it should be supported. They, they should be supported by parents, no or caregivers. But Unfortunately, there are parents also who are traumatized and haven't resolved their trauma. So when parents are traumatized, have history of previous trauma, they don't have proper back attachment skills, they might not be emotionally equipped to support these children, right? So that could make the problem worse. However, when you have supportive caregivers, children can be protect from, protected from the destructive consequences of trauma. So something that I want to also touch about was understanding the body's alarm system. So everyone has an alarm system. So it's like a fight or flight response. So when working with children, it's important for us to sit with them and see how they're feeling and understand what their responses are. So recognize what is this alarm and why is their body reacting? Where is the real trouble and seek help? Right and deep breathing and relaxation methods help. So we'll talk about that more. So what can you do as an adult? One is main thing is to assure the child that he assure that the child is safe. Keep explaining to them that they are not responsible. So to check, make sure that they're safe, they're in a safe environment, or if they're going to be repeatedly abused again. Then explain that he or she is not responsible again and again. Sometimes even if you tell it a hundred times, they're still not going to accept it because they blame themselves for events that are completely out of their control. And be patient. Some children might recover quickly. They are resilient. They have high levels of resilience. They can bounce back soon. But some children, they have, they live through it so much that they can't come out of it easily. And even if you repeatedly tell them not to feel guilty or bad, they might still do. So you need to keep reassuring them and being there for them. And of course, seek the help of a trained professional. So some of the ways I thought we'll uh, talk about few ways, but how we respond to children with trauma for mental health practitioners. So one is to provide education and hope. 
you need to give these people hope that whatever treatment, whatever counseling you're going to do is going to work and that they are going to work it out of their trauma, right? And give them a lot of hope. So educate them about it, right? Including parents. Parents can be some, can, parents are like the main tool that we could use to help these children. Right. So educate the parents about what trauma is, what abuse is, what kind of abuse their child has gone, what kind of way they would need support to recover. Right. Educate the parents. Match care to child needs and phase of recovery. So you don't just dive into treatment or dive, dive into therapy or counseling. So you first have to attend to the basic needs, like I said, to make sure that they are safe. Make sure they have shelter and that they're reuniting family so that they are not alone and they are safe and they have their basic things. So there are children who are abused in their own homes. So again, sometimes those children are taken out and given to uh, uh, the aunts or grandmothers or someone from the family who is willing to take their responsibility. Right? So there you need to ensure that the child is safe and they are reunited with someone whom we can trust. Then assess initial, initial responses and arrange to follow up over time. So you know you can't do everything on one day, but you need to keep following it up. Support parent, family, and community efforts to provide safe, developmentally appropriate environments. Right? So here again, you have to provide education. Teach the parents what it is like and what needs to be done they can make a whole lot of difference because you might only see this child once or twice, like once a week or twice a week, but they're going to be with the parents or their caregivers most of the time. So they can play a huge role in helping recover this child. So after the trauma, allow children to express their feelings if they want to, right? And even help parents because they might be going through a lot because knowing your child being abused or traumatized is not easy for a parent or a caregiver to process and accept. So you need to help the parent also there and assess risk factors. So assess that at all times because we never know what kind of situation child is in and how the child might need intervention. So sometimes it could be uh, once a week sessions or sometimes it could be a family session where you speak the whole family or sometimes it could be no talking or anything, just being with them there, allowing them to color, allowing them to express themselves, right? So also be mindful about what kind of things that you need to do like you need to address so if children are showing destructive behaviors or harming behaviors right they feel severe distress or distra uh, numbing themselves or harming themselves right so so it is also important that the counselors and as therapists mental health professionals that we address this Then you need to understand child, family, and cultural perspectives. Listen carefully to the child and family. Sometimes we are in a hurry to tell them what to do, but we need to stop and listen to what these parents and children have to say, what kind of support that you can give them, right? Only if you listen to them carefully can we, will we be able to give it in a very culturally accepted way. So sometimes uh, you can incorporate extended family. Sometimes the grandparents are very caring. Sometimes the cousins can provide more support and make the child not feel alone. So you have to always incorporate any kind of ties of family will, that will help the child. Then ask about and respect cultural and spiritual perspectives. So you know how different Sri Lanka is a very multicultural country and we have different cultures and different approaches. Sometimes what we learn in terms of CBT or you know, very uh, evidence-based treatment, we can't just follow it. We can't do it. We need to understand the environment and then culturally adapt whatever it is so that it caters that particular child and the family. Right? So bring in support as much as you can in your therapy and take care of yourself. So you need as a mental health practitioner, working with children who are going through abuse is not an easy task, trust me. It can be emotionally draining. You can experience a lot of burnout. Sometimes I, I can remember the first time I, during my training, I listened to a whole hour of an abuse case I had goosebumps all over my body. I can still remember that. And I had to just go out and tell my uh, consultant, so I, I just don't know what to do. 
right so it's okay that is fine so as mental health professionals it's okay to feel that burnout to know that you are not doing okay right so you need to get supervision when you need get help from your supervisors have supervisor uh, supervisions discuss with your team what might be the best approach sometimes you might have different inputs coming in and engage in self care always take time for yourself know your limits know where you need to stop and take a break for yourself right so what we also need to remember i want to kind of add this side on is because sometimes children don't come with just trauma they don't just come with oh, i was being sexually abused or i was being abused or traumatized they come with multiple issues that they are facing at the same time so sometimes they might be going through poverty at home behavior problems academic problems or older substance use right or community violence uh, witnessing domestic abuse at home right or children who are neglected so it's all combined together when they come in for issues with childhood adversities so it's never just one thing that you need to uh, you will have to be addressing it will be multiple things and children therefore will be at more risk will be suffering more because they are going through other challenges as well so especially adolescents they have a lot of issues they are growing up body changes emotional changes so they have a lot and issues at home they are mostly at conflicts with their parents so they don't want to share it with anyone you know very self aware for their age and then this trauma abuse or sometimes ongoing abuse that's a lot for them to take through for their age so when they come in when they step in just remember that this child or this young person is coming in with a lot that they're going through and the fact that they're stepping in to get support itself means a lot which you need to encourage so depending on where they are comfortable individual or group sessions could be tailored according to some children or young people might be uh, might benefit more from individual sessions by some adolescents they might benefit more with group sessions where they feel like okay i'm not alone there's someone else also has gone through it and it's not just me right so you need to tailor it accordingly so i'll quickly run through some therapy techniques so some cbt techniques is that stress management and relaxation skills so you need i know as counselors we know how uh, we are very quite aware of stress management techniques like organize the day or practice relaxation skills so including something called which we call progressive muscle reaction especially for those children who have gone through sexual or physical abuse where they experience very difficult physical sensations when they are triggered right so teaching them progressive muscle relaxation which is tightening of the muscles alternatively you can always google it up right helps with a lot of children who experience very uh, uncomfortable physical situation uh, sensations after abuse right so relaxation skills breathing exercises helps a lot for children right exposure strategy so exposing the child little by little to what happened not at first not at the second session but eventually when you know that this child is ready to talk about it you slowly expose this child and try to initiate conversation so they are not fearing or anxious about what took place correcting distorted ideas or beliefs so like i said children who go through abuse be, start believing that it was their fault they are the ones who initiated it they allowed it to happen right so you as a counselor or as a mental health practitioner need to correct these and tell them that no it doesn't it doesn't mean that way addressing on changing addressing and changing unhealthy and wrong views resulted from the trauma so again they have these views okay this happened to me i'm never going to have a proper life i'm never going to have like a happy life in my for the rest of my life right children who have been abused don't have proper futures they don't get good husbands right the girls always come with that notion but again you would eventually slowly slowly address and change these views involve parents as much as possible especially young children who have been abused and are traumatized the parental love affection and intervention can be can make wonders so be mindful sometimes it's kind of a, that's a mistake that we take talk so i want to share some things that i used to do it with kids especially when i was at lrh there was a lot of uh, and when i was working in the uh, training in the government sector psychiatry course there were a lot of children who came in through abuse so this was some of the, the three circles but i think there are other ways this is called also 
so normally I will say so normally the children who come in. I'm sorry, Pradeep, keep please give me about 10 minutes. No, I'm almost done. No, that, is that is fine. That is fine, Amara. Yeah. That is fine. Uh, so, you can carry on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have these activities, the children come in and, you know, sometimes the parents know what has happened or sometimes the parents don't know, but then you have to assess this child and try to, they come in with, they are not responsive or that there's a change in behavior or not studying. So when we do the psychological assessment initially, we draw this. So we like try to talk, uh, what is your name? How old are you? Uh, and, you know, very, uh, you know, very short and sweet um, uh, conversations and then you draw this and then I tell them uh, and then the second the second circle so we say write the people that you like a little and the third circle is for write the names of the people that you don't like or you hate right so, and then sometimes it takes them about five to 10 minutes and they do fill it in, right? And sometimes if you realize, start to realize that the people who are either the first level or the third level of the circle could be people who might be abusing this child. So there was an instance where it was a grandfather who was physically and emotionally abusing the child. Right, so he had written his grandfather's name in the outermost circle, and then was like, then first I we talk about the good thing first, right? So why do you like your mom so much? So you initiate conversation, and then you go on the next line, and then you go to the outer circle, and then you ask how I see it. See a hari and then sometimes they go on to just tell it like a narrative story. So there might be instances where you could probe more and pick up through that when you are discussing with the child, right? So this is something that I used to do and it has helped me a lot, especially for children, uh, when working with children, right? Then the complete the sentence activity. So this is also somewhere like you can get them to fill. So you, find, you can find a lot of these online. You ask them to fill these things they think it's some random activity, you know, so they'll do it. Talking about their problem is something they are not comfortable or they don't do. But they'll just fill in stuff, draw in stuff, you know, do draw circles. That's something that as children they would do. Then again, you talk, so you add favorite color, then best friend, and the middle you talk about how I how I feel, then what I worry about, or I love, or what you're afraid of. So questions like that. And then you initiate conversation on this. So you have said that you worry about being going to school. Why do you say so? Is there something that you don't like? Is that something that's happening? And then sometimes they come up with a story. And sometimes it's not easy, right? I'm afraid of going to this particular uncle's place. Why is that? Is there someone who's why is there someone who you who is there a cousin of yours who doesn't play with you? Or someone is carrying you. And then they go on to know there's his uncle, he always, you know, he holds me, I'm not comfortable, I'm afraid of him. So it comes out little by little. Sometimes you'll never get the story in the first or second day, but eventually you'll be able to at least identify that this child is at risk or is being abused or traumatized, right? Sometimes it could be a past thing that had happened and now that they are afraid of the whole scenario, afraid of men afraid of uncles, afraid of women, so afraid of teachers who are very strict, afraid of school, afraid of going in the van. So, you know, these are small things that you can pick up through very simple activities, right? So then, like I said, simple activities, try to build rapport, uh, especially with the adolescent, it will be very difficult trying to get them to talk. But uh, of course, it's a lot of effort that you need to put into talk about things that they're interested about, you can talk about how you are interested in things that they are interested, you know, like uh, try to get to know about that and pretend like, you know, so what I do is usually when children come and there are kids who read or something like that. So I try to relate with them on something that they like. So it kind of make them feel a bit comfortable to even so it, we might not talk about anything the first session. They'll go home knowing that okay, she's something that I can, someone I can speak to 
that kind of image, that kind of you know impression. So when they come in for the second or third session, then eventually feel that okay, she, maybe I can trust her with something. So that is progress, but it happens very slowly, unfortunately, when it comes to children or adolescents, because unlike adults, they can't think independently, critically analyze what's going through, come out and reach out for help. Okay. Then comes how we need to be aware of potential pitfalls as mental health practitioners. So we need to always remember that assume it is you should not assume that all children will respond to trauma in the same way. So like I said before, some children may experience a lot of trauma and bounce back. Their levels of resilience might be high, but there might be children who only see, go through one event and are entirely traumatized. So you should not, when a child is traumatized, like you notice their history has multiple traumas, trying to probe and put them through trauma-based therapy might not be effective because they are not traumatized, right? They might be reacting in a different way and they might be, you know, doing it, showing it in a different manner. Then pathologizing early distress or reactions, saying, diagnosing them with depression or disorders will not help, right? So help them to understand and try to understand what the child is going through. So there's always a story behind. Then conveying the message that trauma exposure inevitably results in long-term psychological damage. So a lot of people think if you expose this particular person to trauma, it will have long-term psychological damage, right? That doesn't also mean that you should always expose them to their trauma, talk about their traumatic story. Some people might heal through exposing to their trauma. Some people might heal without exposing to their trauma. So it's always as a mental health practitioner, knowing where your client stands and then therefore taking it from there. Sometimes trauma exposure should not happen in the initial stages, only towards the mid and towards the end when the client knows that they are able to cope with it. Sometimes just a trigger is enough to get them going. So also assuming that all trauma exposed children will have long-term damage or need treatment. No, not everyone do that. Right? Then creating situations in which trauma exposed children have little choice or control. So make them feel like they have a say that they are not alone. Right? And then forcing children or parents to tell their story. Right? So this happens, this mistake happens a lot. This re-traumatizes, re which is why it's important when you take the first person who takes the history, wherever you're working, taking down the notes, it's important that you take in all the details, it's your responsibility. Right, because they'll explain a lot of things that they might not be comfortable talking in, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we have caught the points. But forcing them to say it again or do it again can be re-traumatized. Right? Then ignoring your own stress from trauma-focused clinical work. Like I said before, working with children who are traumatized is never ever going to be easy. Even if you are a social worker, right? About forget being a counselor or a therapist, even being a social worker is very scary. <laughs> right it's you don't know how it how long it would take you take for you to experience a burnout and that burnout can be really bad you won't be able to provide the potentially best support or service you could for that child because you know listening to stories of these children on the news and on the tv or you know media itself is traumatizing for us and then imagine going into details and speaking and trying to help this child can be very traumatic for you as well so always keep in mind that you take self, you know, take um, uh, enough breaks, have self care, very importantly, and take breaks, like a lot of breaks that you know you are ready to go back and help that particular client. So I think that's about it from my presentation.